So recently, YouTube decided to recommend to me every video ever made by Jenny Nicholson. I mean, I guess it makes sense. I watch Lindsay Ellis, so the algorithm knows that I like watching girls with hot takes on movies, and I also watch FWAB, so the algorithm knows that I like watching YouTubers who put no effort into their presentation. Anyways, I recently decided I really like Jenny Nicholson. Like, maybe too much. Maybe I have an addiction to Jenny Nicholson videos. I recently went and saw Dora in this city of gold, and while I was processing through my complicated feelings on the movie, I realized that my inner monologue was taking on a very specific, kind of feminine, rambly tone of voice. And that gave me an idea for a video. Hopefully it's obvious what that video idea was. I've been looking forward to whenever Nickelodeon finally made a live-action Dora the Explorer movie for years now. I don't know, I've just always thought that idea had a lot of potential. So I went and saw Dora in this city of gold, and woo boy is it a mixed bag. I have a lot of feelings about this movie. Some of them are good. Most aren't. I wanted to talk about all these feelings in a sort of organized fashion, and so I have made a numbered list. Number one, pacing. So much happens in the first act of this movie. Like, more things than should happen in the first act of a less than two hour movie. It starts with Dora and Diego as six year olds. They play around for about half a minute, then they get some exposition for another half a minute, then they have a sweet little conversation in Spanish, then Diego leaves for the city. This is all within like less than five minutes. Also, whenever Diego moves, they call the place Diego's moving to the city, even though where they're currently living is in Peru, where Diego's moving to is in LA. That's multiple countries away. It just kind of bugs me because like if you live in Peru, the city means like Lima, right? But he lives in LA. Would they, would they not just say LA? I don't know, whatever. Time skip. Dora is 16, still exploring the jungle, living with her parents. She finds a map to the ancient city her parents are trying to find, but she can't get to it because there's this big chasm, and she tries to jump across and she it doesn't work. Her parents decide this means she's not ready to help them, and sends her away to go live with Diego. <laughs> I don't know what that voice was. Dora loses contact with her parents while she's still going to high school, and a lot is happening while this is happening. She's experiencing her first day in high school and her first couple weeks in high school. She reunites with Diego, who's like a cool kid at school now and doesn't like nerdy things like Dora likes. She also meets a nerdy kid who's not really a character, and I don't remember his name. I will continue to refer to him as the nerdy boy throughout the rest of this video. She also meets Sammy, who's like the class president. Uh, Dora goes to a school dance, her and Diego have a fight, then her, Diego, Sammy, and Nerdy Kid are all on a field trip at a museum, then they get kidnapped and taken back to the jungle where they meet Swiper and the obvious twist villain. <laughs> all of this takes place in 20 or 30 minutes, and like, they go back and forth between really sad stuff and actually funny jokes just constantly back and forth. Most of the movie's best jokes are within these 20 minutes too. And then and then for the whole rest of the movie, like they explore the jungle and nothing really happens. There's maybe one or two other jokes, but like why did they rush through all of it? They didn't seem to have anything interesting to do or say once they got back to the jungle. So why did we rush through all the rest of it? Why did none of the emotional stuff, like, happen after the plot started? <laughs> Number two, vlogging. V is for vlogging. So in the Dora cartoon, she's always talking to the camera, right? Kind of conversing with the audience. It's supposed to feel interactive, even though it's really not. They sort of make fun of this within the first two minutes. Like, Dora talks to the camera and says, Say delicioso! And her parents are like, she's gonna... She's gonna grow out of that, right? Well, she doesn't grow out of it. What she does is she gets a GoPro, and as she's exploring the jungle, she'll talk to it and, like, educate her audience on the Spanish names for things. Dora, in this movie, is a vlogger, and it's the 
best creative decision you can do for an aged up Dora movie. I loved it. Like, from that moment, I was like, yes, I am on board with this movie. That's so smart. The only problem with this is that we only see it happen in that specific scene right after the time skip. After that, no more vlogging. We don't even see the GoPro later on, I think. Which makes me feel like what I thought was a really smart creative decision was actually just a product placement scene. And now I just kind of feel betrayed. Number three, popularity. So Dora isn't popular in school, which I find kind of hard to believe. I was homeschooled, so I could be wrong, but I feel like someone who's as nice and attractive and funny and kind-hearted, optimistic, hard-working, etc. as Dora is, can't possibly be made fun of in as a genuinely mean-spirited way as she is in this movie. It's kind of like in The Amazing Spider-Man, where you don't feel bad for Peter Parker because he's like a cool skater who's also a talented photographer and like he's attractive. <laughs> So, like, you don't feel like he's the nerd like you should. It's kind of like that. Like, she's too cool for you to believe that she's not cool. This is made a lot worse by how rushed the first act of the movie is. Like, they really do kind of cram half of a high school movie into, like, a montage. And so, like, it's not until after the montage and we're in the dance that we're really sure just how unpopular Dora is. There's, like, one line of someone making fun of her. The rest is her meeting the other important characters, one of whom likes her, the other of whom is embarrassed of her because they're cousins, and the other one is Sammy, who is honestly jealous of her. So it kind of feels like Dora is maybe popular, but no, apparently it's just the whole school other than the one nerdy kid just doesn't like Dora. Which again, you don't find out until Dora and Diego are having a fight about it. Speaking of which, number four is Go Diego Go! I never really watched Go Diego Go, but I feel like they kinda did his character a little dirty when making this movie. Like, I can't imagine he was nearly this mean-spirited. I just have a, a feeling that it wasn't a very faithful adaptation. They try to give him an arc, which is more than they do for most characters, so I like it. But he's mean at first, and then as the movie goes on, he gets less mean and he apologizes to Dora. But the arc has no middle point. He never really is forced to learn this lesson. He never struggles with it. He's just in the jungle where he's not being peer pressured to be mean to Dora anymore, so he stops. There was no internal conflict, so once he gets back to school, he's just gonna start being mean again, right? Why would he stop? Because he has a girlfriend now? Oh yeah, so Diego has a love interest in this movie. It's, uh, it's Sammy, the nerdy girl I mentioned earlier. Um, Dora kinda also has a love interest in Nerdy Boy, but uh, Nerdy Boy isn't really a character, so I'm not going to address that. Anyways, Diego apologizes for being a real Jack, but only because no one was really forcing him to be a real Jack. So he just kind of stops. Like, what kind of a lesson is that? Like, if you struggle with peer pressure, don't worry. One day those peers won't be around anymore. Then you can apologize to the people you were pressured into being mean to. And there will be no consequences. I like that they at least tried to give him an arc. They don't really do that with anyone else. So, so really this is the complaint I feel the least strongly about. But Joe, why is it number four? Because I'm parodying Jenny Nicholson and therefore the numbers are arbitrary. That's the whole joke of this video and it's a joke she's made in her own videos. Yeah, this whole thing is just a trick to get you to listen to my opinions on the Dora movie. Number five, Sammy. I've mentioned Sammy a couple times. She is a new character introduced to this movie. She's kind of the school cl class president, top of the class kind of character. Um, she's mean to Dora, but she's also a nerd. So, like, 
Diego's also mean to her at first. The Roomba's beeping. I don't know what's up with that. Um, so they're kind of rivals, uh, but like neither one of them is considered cool by anyone else in the school. So I'm not sure what they're competing over. I feel like the actress did a great job as playing her. Like, I really loved her performance. But I feel like the writers never really thought through what the point of her character was. She's portrayed as, like, this know-it-all, top-of-the-class character. But when it comes down to it, it's never demonstrated that she's intelligent in any way. There are multiple scenes where she's pressed on, like, hey, do you know this thing? And she never knows the thing, even when it's something she has a vested interest in. Like when she's selling muffins to save the rainforest, she straight up doesn't know stuff about the rainforest when Dora asks her. And then later in the movie, Diego, who's supposed to be like a jock too, school for co too cool for school, excuse me, Diego remembers something they learned in class, and Sammy doesn't. Sammy's supposed to be the smart one. Why does Diego remember? Like, why does she feel so threatened by Dora if, like, other kids in the class are also smarter than her? It's very confusing. I think the idea is supposed to be that, like, her knowledge and her skills of things are very surface level, whereas Dora's very genuine about her interest in those things. At least I think that's what they were doing. I don't know. It feels like it's supposed to be nuanced, but it comes off as contradictory, because there's just kind of holes that don't make sense. And also, like, she refers to herself as Queen Bee of the school, and, like, she threatens Dora, but, like, if she doesn't have any social status, because she's a nerd just like Dora, then, like, what's the point of that threat? Like, I think the idea there is that she's delusional about how popular she is in the school but like if the verbal and physical bullying at the school is as bad as we're shown it to be how can she possibly be delusional enough to think that people like her <laughs> no one's really hiding their uh their likes or dislikes at the school it's just kind of everyone's very hateful and they bully each other it's not a very good school. Also, Diego hangs out with those same bullies that bully Dora. Surely those guys bully Sammy too, right? Like that makes sense because she's the biggest nerd in class before Dora shows up. And this never comes up whenever Diego and her like start having romance with each other later in the movie. In fact, it's not addressed at all whether Sammy got bullied or not. But she must have, right? Diego says everyone hates her. So they must have at least made fun of her. Right? Like, this is a character that's like one of the most important characters. And like, they never really explain who she is. Because who she is just kind of changes based on the scene. For like, whatever they needed her to do to move the plot forward. Number six, obvious twist villain. Okay, this one's pretty quick and easy to explain. Obvious twist villains that are in, like, every kid's movie nowadays, it's, it's bad. It needs to stop. We all agree on that, right? He's especially obvious and annoying in this movie, too. Like, he shows up. Dora doesn't believe his explanation for who he is. He does a bunch of unlikable stuff. Surprise, he's the bad guy. Number... Number seven. Number seven, the Inca. So the hidden city that Dora's parents are trying to find is an ancient Inca city called Parapata. I don't know how much of the way the Inca are portrayed in this movie is true to what we know about real life Inca. I'm gonna guess the fact that they had very elaborate aqueducts, uh, that's probably real. The way their written language is just a series of knots, I'm gonna guess that's real. But like, how would we s know what Inca spoken language sounds like? I'm gonna guess that one's not real. Oh, and the fact that there's still like a whole religion of still living Inca dedicated to protecting Parapata. That's probably made up. 
Oh, by the way, the Inca that are still around in this movie, they also have magic powers. But, like, the only time we see a magic power used is when this old lady in a funny hat reveals she's actually a hot lady in a dress. But it was a magic disguise. But, like, this same old lady, the only time we see her early in the movie, like, we know she was part of the Inca tribe or whatever that was trying to keep them out of the city. And all she does is kind of point them in the wrong direction and yell at them as they run in the correct direction. Like, why didn't she use magic? If she had magic, she just disguised herself? Like, the disguise doesn't really make sense. Like, they wouldn't have known who the hot lady in the cool dress was. Why did she have to be a funny-looking old lady? It doesn't make sense. Also, the twist bad guy... Uh, he claims, like, towards the end of the movie that, oh yeah, there aren't real Incas trying to stop us from getting to the city. I made that up. But by that point in the movie, he should know for a fact that they're real. Also, the symbol that we see that's associated with this tribe, it's the same on the stuff he says he made up, and in the actual tribe's, like, tattoos. That's, that doesn't make sense. Also, in that scene when he is making it up, Dora speaks some ancient Inca, and he translates it, which doesn't make sense because his false identity as a linguistics professor? That was part of his lie. That was his fake backstory. So how does he know how to speak ancient Inca? But none of that is what really confuses me about the Inca in this movie. In like one of the last scenes, in like the climax of the movie, Dora's in the final room of the temple, and they have to choose like, what is it the Inca valued most? Like that's the riddle they have to solve to get through this last room of the temple. And like the bad guy, he's like, well obviously they valued gold, and that's wrong because that's you know, it's wrong. So he almost dies, and then Dora's like, no, it's water. That's, that's the right answer. Why was water the right choice? Like, obviously the gold was the wrong choice, but like the Inca are established to like gold. Like, he gives reasons why, like, gold is the closest the Inca could get to touching the sun. It like represented, like, what the gods looked like to them. We're not told what water represents. There's no previously established metaphor for what water could represent in this movie. They had literally the whole movie to build up to this, to kind of set this dichotomy up. Were they just really proud of their aqueducts? Okay, but that's not even the weirdest part. I should have, like, divided up the Inca into several more added bullets on my numbered list. So, the Inca in this movie really love monkeys. Like, they have statues of monkeys everywhere, their idols are all to this monkey god, who- the monkey god is real, by the way. In the movie. Not in real life. But, like, the monkey god tries to kill Dora. What is this movie? <laughs> all their idols and art, like, always feature these monkeys, and a lot of these monkeys look a lot like boots. And like, it's set up through the whole movie that there's something weird about boots. In one of the very first scenes, Dora's like, boots can talk. And Diego's like, monkeys can't talk. And then like, towards the end of the movie, boots talks. What's up with that? Is he maybe related to the Inca monkey god? The movie doesn't tell us. It's just just kind of weird. Number eight, Swiper. So Swiper is actually like the best part of this movie. He doesn't like move around like a CG character. He moves like a like a stop motion character. So he feels very solid. So like when they do slapstick with him, he'll like smack into, oh, the AC's on. I hope the mic doesn't pick that up. <laughs> Anyways, Swiper will like smack into stuff and it'll feel solid. So it's, the, the slapstick is very funny and it works. And like the voice acting is very funny, but that's the problem. Swiper has voice acting, 
You remember how the last number on this numbered list, I talked about how Boots is a monkey and he's not supposed to be able to talk? Well, Swiper talks all the time. No one questions it. Why can foxes just just talk in this universe? The only other animal characters in this movie are like a poisonous frog. He doesn't talk. There's a couple alligators, and there's one scene where we see all the animal friends from the original Dora cartoon. But that's inside a hallucination. Those aren't real. Which is why it's silly. Like Benny the Talking Bull, he's, he's a hallucination. Talking bulls can't be real. But Swiper's real. <laughs> Obviously, Swiper's real. The hallucination scene is really funny, though. Like, they're in this maze of giant flowers, and they can't touch the flowers because they'll release poison spores. And they almost make it through and twist bad guy because it can't be anyone else because we're supposed to like them. Twist bad guy accidentally touches one, and they all spit spores. And Diego's very quickly like, hold your breath. And twist bad guy apparently can't hold his breath longer than two seconds. So they all breathe it, and Dora's like, it's okay, if they were actually poison, we would be dead already. It's been two seconds, Dora, I don't think that's how that works. And then they all start hallucinating, and everything's cartoon, and we see all the animal friends from the original Dora series, and she says, everyone is here. I'm not sure if it's meant to be a Smash Bros joke. Like, like, this is not a joke I'm making. That's just a joke she makes in the movie. Oh, also, obvious twist, bad guy runs off naked. That happens. Number nine, ages. All four main characters in this movie look too old to be in high school, which isn't usually a problem for me. Um, like, if it was just Dora, I wouldn't complain. Like, she looks maybe 19, 20, but like... I'll, I'll give her a pass. She's good at playing the role of Dora the Explorer. So it's it's fine. But, like, she looks 18, 19, and she's the youngest looking of the whole main cast. And that's a problem. They all look like they're college seniors, at least. Except Dora, who's, like, maybe a college freshman. Let me look up the exact ages so I can be be more exact with you guys. Okay, so the girl who plays Dora is actually 18. That's younger than I thought. Nicholas Kumb, who plays Dora's nerdy boyfriend, is 24. Diego is 23. Uh, and he's Mark Wahlberg's uh, nephew. Yeah, Mark Wahlberg's nephew, apparently. Let's see, Sammy is played by Madeline Madden. Her name is an alliteration. Bold choice. Uh, she is 22. Oh! Okay, this is a tangent, but Madeline Madden... Let, let's put the computer away. Madeline Madden, who plays Sammy in this movie, is apparently cast as the role of Egwene Alvear in the Wheel of Time TV show. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this. Anyone who's followed my channel long enough knows that I really hold on so I don't know if you guys know this but I'm a big fan of the Wheel of Time books and I have been waiting for good news about the TV show adaptation of the Wheel of Time for years and I just found out that like the whole main cast has been cast because I was looking up the age of an actress from the Dora movie <laughs> Usually when we hear news about the Wheel of Time TV series, it's that, yeah, it's probably not happening, Red Eagle Media and Universal are arguing over the rights, and, like, we have scripts, but, like, at any moment a producer could come in and say, yep, scrap the whole thing, but no, apparently it's gonna be on Amazon Prime, they have the whole cast, they have scripts, the whole, the whole deal. Also, I just watched a whole movie with the actress that plays a queen in it, and like, yeah, I see that. She would play a great Egwene. I'm like actually excited to see this actress play one of my favorite characters in a book on, on a screen. All hail the Merlin seat, baby. I just remembered I'm supposed to be parodying Jenny Nicholson. That was kind of a 
Brian David Gilbert. Uh, let's go back to Jenny Nicholson. So let's talk about theme. Number 10, by the way, theme. So what is this movie about? At the end of the day, whenever they were like, Dora, you really are ready to be an explorer now. Like, what was it that she learned? What was it that she has at the end of the story that she didn't have at the beginning? What, what is this story about? There's a scene at the beginning of the movie where Dora the Explorer uh, finds the map to Parapata. And like there's this chasm in between her and the map. And she tries to jump across, but she doesn't make it. And then she needs her parents' help. And this is why they decide that she's not ready. And the imagery of this chasm and Dora trying to leap over it is used a couple times later in the movie. Uh, most prominently, well, while Dora is hallucinating, she sees the chasm, she can't jump across it still, but then Diego comes and they are able to jump together and make it. Towards the end of the movie, uh, while they're in the temple, there's a challenge that like, it looks like there's a chasm, but actually it's an optical illusion uh, to kind of trick people into not jumping across. Uh, so her, Diego, Sammy, and Nerd Boy all jump across together and they make it. So what does the chasm represent? Is it Dora's fear? Is she insecure and that's holding her back? Well, no, because in the beginning of the movie, she still leaps without looking. So maybe she needs to learn responsibility, uh, when to go around the chasm instead of jumping. But they still jump over it at the end of the movie, too, so that's not it. Also, there's another thing Dora runs into without looking even later in the movie, so it still doesn't work. Maybe she's learned leadership, because like at the beginning she's relying on her parents, at the end she's got a whole group of people following her, but they're not following her. They're the ones who tell Dora, just jump, it'll be okay. And she's the one that's like, I don't, I don't know guys, I don't think we should just, just jump. So. Maybe it's not about leadership. Dora just needs to learn the power of friendship and teamwork. Uh, that makes the most sense of anything I've talked about so far. I think that's probably the intended uh, theme. I mean, if we're being honest, if there's no obvious theme in a kid's work of fiction, it's probably about the power of teamwork and friendship, right? I mean, I play Sonic, and I've heard this message hammered into my head millions of times now. But this theme still doesn't really work for this movie for a couple reasons. I mean, one, Dora was outgoing and friendly from the beginning. She didn't need to learn the value of friendship. She just didn't have any because she lived alone in the jungle. Like, it's not like Dora didn't believe in the power of friendship. It was just that whenever she went out of the jungle and tried to find friends, they didn't like her because she was a nerd. And if Dora was meant to learn the power of friendship, why did the movie have a twist villain? Like, if Dora needs to learn the value in trusting other people, why does she also need to learn that not everyone can be trusted? Maybe it's meant to be nuanced, but there's no real explanation for the apparent contradictions, so it just feels like it doesn't hold up. Okay, let's back up. Maybe the theme isn't really related to the chasm at all. It goes back to the whole water versus gold thing, when Dora has to choose what's most valuable to the Inca. Maybe the water represents knowledge. It's introduced really early on that explorers good and treasure hunters bad. Maybe the idea is that treasure represents wealth or popularity, the things other people value, but the water represents, like, knowledge. And that's why the explorers are good, and, but water doesn't really represent knowledge. I feel like it's gotta be, it's, it's gotta be, like, more obvious than that, right? Like, there's gotta be a lesson that, like, connects everything together, unless it's just not well written that's possible. Also, I kind of made the leap that popularity and wealth are thematically connected, and that's also not set up at all. The worst part of all of this is at the end, 
after telling Dora that she really is worthy of being an explorer and, hey, why don't you come with us on our next adventure? It'll be all three of us, a whole family. Dora says no, and she goes back to high school, which is never really something I got the feeling Dora wanted. Like, why does she want to go back to the school where there's a massive bullying problem and she wasn't really learning anything she couldn't already learn from her parents who are professors is is that what she learned is that why they think she's mature now because she desires worldly real life boring things instead of wanting to be an explorer like her parents who are successful at it why is it good for her to forsake something she's talented at for something that doesn't really seem to benefit her unless the movie is about how growing up means that your individuality dies. Oh my god, guys, this movie is about how growing up makes your individuality die. The longer the movie goes, right, Dora loses kind of her personality. Like, the tone of the movie gets more and more boring. I said that from the beginning, that, like, it starts out exciting and fun, and as it goes, it gets more and more generic. Almost like... Dora's losing the childish side of her and the lens of imagination she sees the world through is disappearing as she gets older and is forced to mature. She never really becomes a leader or learns responsibility. She just learns to become a part of a group, just a cog in a machine. Sammy is also kind of treated as annoying and unwanted for pursuing things that she seems to enjoy. And Diego, Diego learns that he needs to be nicer to his friends, but the movie also never shows that him being peer pressured and giving into that peer pressure was bad. In fact, I feel like the movie kind of encourages that. Like you just gotta do what you gotta do to survive. That's what he tells Dora towards the beginning of the movie. There's a moment where he takes off her colorful headband and he tells her, just try to keep your head down. We're all, we're all just trying to do what we got to do to survive. So he, he takes the closest thing Dora has to jewelry and kind of messes her hair up a little so she'll blend in more. And he tells her, just survive. That's what the gold and the water represent. The gold and the jewelry represents like the freedom to afford to express yourself and stand out. But water is just something you need to survive. It doesn't represent anything. It's just water, something you biologically need. Diego tells her in that first scene, this isn't the jungle. You can't just do whatever you want. And what is money but the ability to be able to afford whatever you want? Why is Diego's worldview in the beginning of the movie affirmed? And trust me, I watched this movie twice. There's nothing that the gold and the water represent that makes sense. Except that one represents what Dora wants. The ability to self-express and do whatever she wants. And the water just represents water. Survival. This is the only thing in the whole movie that that choice at the end parallels. And then Dora solidifies this by not choosing the thing that she actually wants to do with her life, but choosing the mundane part of the group life she's been conditioned to now be a part of. And she goes back to the school, and the scene that rules during the credits is the one scene in the movie where Dora isn't wearing bright pink or orange. She's wearing just plain white clothes, like the... Dora personality's been sucked out of her. She's colorless and lifeless, dancing around as part of the whole school, and they're all dancing together. Like, she fits in now. Now, that point about her color palette being washed out, you might think that's me poking fun at Jenny Nicholson, because that's a pretty key point in her, uh, her Christmas Prince video, which is maybe my favorite Jenny Nicholson video that I've watched. But it's actually kind of the other way around. Like, I took Jenny Nicholson's format so that I could make a point that I felt like was something she would make about the theme of a movie most of you probably don't care about, 
And if I really was Jenny Nicholson, I would end this video with a clever joke. Okay, so this movie doesn't have a post credit scene, but I'm kind of surprised it doesn't, because... Like, Nickelodeon owns so many franchises with some kind of connection to jungle adventures. Like, Dora and Diego, obviously. They just did a Legends of the Hidden Temple live-action movie not too long ago, right? I don't know anything about Legends of the Hidden Temple. But there's also, um, The Wild Thornberries. And The Wild Thornberries had a crossover with the Rugrats. Oh, and Hey Arnold's parents went missing in the jungle. They did a whole movie about that recently, too. Uh, Nickelodeon could be making the 90s cartoon equivalent of the Avengers, but with jungle adventure movies. But they won't do it because they're cowards.